Hi, Kim Eagle here for ACC.org. We're at ACC 21, the National Scientific Sessions, covering the clinical trials. And today we're talking about trials that are presented on May 17th, Monday. Um, this is such a great meeting. There were so many trials to choose from. Uh, and we found five that we wanted to talk to you today about that are being presented. We're gonna start with a paper uh, looking at uh, the use of one of the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, Soloist Scored. Deepak, tell us about this interesting study. Absolutely, so this was a patient level meta-analysis of the Soloist and Scored trials. Both were presented at AHA and published in NEGM. Bottom line, they showed that the SGLT2 inhibitor, actually an SGLT1 slash 2 inhibitor, sodium flozin, significantly reduced the primary endpoint of, of heart failure type events. What we showed now with this meta-analysis was that that benefit was consistent across the full range of ejection fraction, importantly, also including heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and importantly, with benefits that were consistent in both men and women. Women, of course, especially older ones being at particular risk for HEFPAP. So at least in the opinion of the executive committee, we felt for the first time we'd shown uh, in a, a pre-specified analysis of randomized data from clinical trials a significant effect of a therapy on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, additionally demonstrating a, a consistent benefit in men and women. So uh, I think that this does move forward the field of SGLT2 inhibition. It moves forward the field of HEFPEF. And I think the effects we saw are likely class effects of SGLT2 inhibitors. Obviously more trial data will be coming probably at ESC with respect to HEFPEF and, and other SGLT2 inhibitors but my feeling is that this is a class effect, and at least for patients with diabetes and HEFPEF, I think these data do show that um, the SGLT2 inhibitor is the way to go. For patients without diabetes, we'll have to wait for the ongoing EMPA and DAPA trials looking at HEFPEF. Yeah, I was, I was very impressed with the size of the effect across uh, low EF, mid-range EF, and HEFPEF. They, they looked similar, and that really is reassuring that this effect is real. And in some ways, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to see in HEFPEF a chance for some therapies that really work. Absolutely. So I think, you know, this really should change our standard of care with respect to use of SGLT2 inhibitors across the full spectrum of EF, at least in patients with diabetes and in patients with heart failure, again, if they've got diabetes across that full spectrum uh, of ejection fraction. Great. The second trial I wanted us to cover today was called LIFE. Pyle, tell us about this trial. So, you know, in Paradigm, we saw that an ARNI uh, obviously improves outcomes in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but less than 1% of those patients, Kim, were patients with NYHA class four. So this really focused in on those patients and said, what is the effect of an ARNI on natriuretic peptides and on outcomes in patients with New York Heart Association class four heart failure? And unfortunately, the trial was negative. So the primary endpoint, which was change in natriuretic peptides, there was no difference between the ARNI and Valsartan alone. And then the second secondary endpoint was clinical outcomes, days out of the hospital and freedom from heart failure events, also no difference. Now I'll make the comment that this was done obviously during the COVID pandemic. So they actually had to reduce their sample size, which was originally planned at 400 down to 355 because of the pandemic affecting trial enrollment. So I think this may be underpowered. Um, that's one piece of it. But of course, it also tells us that perhaps the activation of the RAS system in end stage heart failure is just so aggressive that despite having this great medication, this ARNI, we really weren't able to modify it. Now it did give us some safety information about the ARNI, it told us there was not more hypotension, there was not more renal failure, slightly more hyperkalemia, but it was not life threatening. So it, it makes us feel reassured to use this medication in our class four patients, but unfortunately doesn't appear to be improving their outcomes or their natriuretic peptides. Excellent. I, I agree completely with your analysis. There's a trial also today called Galactic HF. Deepak, tell us about this study. Yeah, absolutely. So this is an important, well-done study also. It looks at omicaptiv mecarbil. Uh, that is, if you haven't heard about it in the audience, a, a selective cardiac myosin activator, sometimes called a myotrope. And in Galactic HF, that drug improved the primary endpoint of heart failure events or cardiovascular death in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, EF less than or equal to 35%. What the investigators have done now is analyze the data as a function of that EF. That is, if they're in the really low range, 
within the patients enrolled, say less than the median of 28% or greater than that median. And what they, they, what they found is you basically get more bang for your buck with the lower ejection fraction, which makes intuitive sense. And I think that uh, you know, while the benefits in the overall trial were modest in magnitude, the benefits seem much larger at the extremes of very low ejection fractions. So I, I think that this drug might actually have a valuable role in patients that are already maxed out on other therapies uh, but have very low ejection fractions. But, but Kim, what do you think? Well, I would agree with you. I was impressed to see the size of benefit uh, increase the lower the ejection fraction went. Uh, and, you know, it's so exciting to have potentially paradigm changing therapies available. You know, we have with hypertrophic disease, Mevacamtan, and now with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, potentially this myosin activator. So a whole new world for us in terms of managing heart failure is beginning to open, I think. Pyle, did you have any comment? Uh, no, I would agree. And, and it's, it's, you know, very interesting because when we get into those very low EF patients, we really start to run out of therapy. So to have this kind of an effect and to see a more pronounced effect, it makes you feel better about that polypharmacy layering on more and more medications that you're actually doing something for them. Great. Let's move on then to Fidelio DKD AFib. Pyle, your thoughts? You know, uh, Kim, I'm very fascinated by AFib because I live in Colorado where we see a ton of AFib, but it's a very different AFib than what we see in the regular community. And this, you know, based, based on preclinical pre studies that tell us that mineraloreceptor activation can, you know, be involved in AFib and, and, you know, inhibiting that can actually reduce inflammation and fibrosis. So this studied finerenone, which is a novel selective MRA um, that has been previously shown to improve outcomes in patients with CBD and CKD. And it really looked to see whether or not it impacted their new onset AFib outcomes. And I was very impressed to see the results because just at six months, we saw a dramatic decrease uh, with a relative risk reduction of 29% in new onset AFib. Um, and that risk continued to be reduced even after for the duration of the follow-up. And there was really no heterogeneity amongst the subgroups. So what this tells me is that, you know, we're always looking for new ways to prevent AFib. And I really like this proactive approach rather than a reactive approach, which we're so used to doing in medic medicine. You know, we react to the disease rather than thinking about how to prevent it. And this is a nice bench to bedside demonstration of potentially an intervention in these high-risk patients for AFib that could really dramatically reduce their AFib incidence. I agree with your analysis. I'm, I'm intrigued. Do you think Colorado has high-altitude AFib? That's exactly right. And I almost wonder if it's a very different type of disease. And so my thought when I saw this was, would this work on my patients who bike 110 miles in one day, every weekend or whatever, you know, because they have different, they have athletic AFib and they have high altitude AFib, which could be an entirely different disease process. Okay, I, I'm with you. Obviously the, the notion is these drugs can affect uh, atrial fibrosis. Uh, and, and this may be one of the mechanisms by which they tend to reduce the likelihood of AFib. And I, again, it's potentially a, a bit of a paradigm shift in thinking about how we're using medications, uh, classes of medications that we already have in a more preventative strategy. So it's, it's kind of a welcome new uh, opportunity for us. Uh, let's finish with a, I love this one too, Rescue. Uh, this, this is an interesting study, Deepak. I can't even pronounce the name of the drug, but I hope you can. Well, yeah, I think the good news is it, it's an experimental drug right now, uh, Ziltevecumab. It's a fully human monoclonal antibody. It's directed against the IL-6 ligand. And it was studied in a phase two trial presented uh, by my uh, good friend and colleague, Paul Ritko. And basically what it found was that this drug reduced several different biomarkers of inflammation and thrombosis. And therefore one would hope that would reduce cardiovascular events. And indeed there's plans for a large cardiovascular outcome trial. I think that's a Zeus trial if I'm remembering right. So, um, uh, and if it isn't, they should use that as an acronym. It's a, it's a really great acronym. So, you know, we're looking for ways to re reduce residual cardiovascular risk. The CANTOS trial already showed that inflammation uh, is an important target of pharmacotherapy and can reduce ischemic events. That drug, canakinabab, you know, studied in CANTOS, wasn't uh, going to be commercialized for the purposes of cardiovascular indications. But here, with the IL-6 inhibition pathway with this drug, 
you know, it could prove to be a real winner. Of course, we have to see what the large outcome trial shows, but at least these early phase two data look quite promising to me. Yeah, I agree with you. We, we need to find the right anti-inflammatory agent that, that doesn't suppress the immunity such that we're at risk for life-threatening infection. Uh, it seems like the science is building and eventually we're gonna get there. Um, you know, I was reflecting on the meeting and uh, we covered what, 16 trials in our summary and there were another 15 or 16 that were great trials too. And thinking about all of the people that fought through the pandemic to create the science, enroll the patients so that we can learn and get better in our craft. I just, I just uh, feel overwhelmed with um, gratitude, I suppose, for, for the people that do the trials and continue to, to strive for new knowledge that we can use to make our patients have better outcomes. Um, any final comments for the audience that you would like to have, Pyle? You know, Tim, I would just leave the audience by saying, to your point, that despite what we have been through in the last year, all the challenges and everything, science has been triumphant, you know, and we've shown that with the vaccines. Of course, now we're showing that with all of this great research we just presented at the ACC. So I would say that, that you know, we've learned a lot of good lessons from all the trials we've covered, new applications of existing drugs, uh, including new disease conditions, as well as, you know, new types of, of uh, diseases, new diseases as well. So I just think it's been a really nice reflective year. I wish we were meeting in person, but hopefully we will next year. And, and I think we just have to celebrate all the wonderful science that's come out this year. Agree totally. Deepak, final word? Sure. I, I don't know that I can, can top the really nice comments that you both made. I, I think it's been a remarkable virtual ACC. There's been a lot of great science presented and I think the fact that it's occurring in a pandemic, it's something that we'll all remember, you know, for the rest of our lives, we'll tell our grandchildren about. It, it's just been amazing seeing the cardiovascular community come together at this horrible time of pandemic, collaborating globally on trials, the patients still sacrificing their time and energy and all the investigators and, and support personnel, just, uh, you know, striving for a larger purpose in, in the most adverse of circumstances. So it's, it's really inspiring. Thanks to both of you for uh, your comments today on these important trials. Thanks to our learners for tuning in to these wrap-ups. We hope they're useful to you. We enjoy bringing them to you. Um, this is Kim Eagle for ACC.org at the ACC 21 virtual meetings, and we're out. <laughs>